Welcome to Wednesday night. Glad to have you here, braving the weather. Little water on the roads. Yeah, these is not black ice. We're good. We're going to start off tonight with a couple of old hymns. Tis so sweet and be thou my vision. Let's stand. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, and to know the safe the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I
Father, we pray that that was a sweet-smelling aroma to you, our praise. For there is no other who is worthy of it. Take our praise, Father. Take our adoration. Hear our prayers, O God. Renew within us, Father, a right spirit with you. That we may walk in newness of life. In you and in you alone. Is in your powerful and precious name we pray this. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Well, good evening. We're um, excited to be here tonight. We've got a different uh, lineup for you. I think one of the things that we're very blessed about as a congregation is we have a very deep bench. We've got a lot of people who can... Uh, come up here and talk about our questions. I can barely hear me. Can I, well, I hate to ask that, but can y'all hear me? We good? Okay. So I can hear you. You can hear me. Hear That's you. what. All right. Good. You know, before we uh, get into introductions and kind of talk about a few things, that song, "Be Thou My Vision," uh, incredible message. That's one of my. That's one of my favorites, for a number of reasons. But we're we're having technical issues here. But you think, about, you think about what that means about focusing on Christ, especially when we're tempted to focus on so many other things. Um, that's, a, that's a good thing. Don't, don't mind the people behind the curtain. Pay no attention to the people behind the curtain. All right. So, everybody good? We're good? Settled? Sort of? Kind of? We're good. We're good. All right. Uh, a couple of things I want to make you aware of, and this is kind of, it's a good thing. We are, we are as a congregation... I believe God's leading us into a, a one another type mentality, and so we want to talk about how we can love one another, how we can invest in one another, how we can serve one another, a number of passages that, that uh, talk about that. And one of the things that has come up the last few days is we are in a kind of a different season with all of this isolation and the staying at home and the masks and everything. We have a, we have a number of folks in our congregation who, for good reason, have not been out and about. And um, I'm, I'm nervous, not nervous, but I'm concerned that uh, we're not uh, reaching them or making sure they're doing okay. So we're starting a real push uh, to make, have a phone ministry, uh, which is, if you've, ever, if you've ever said, there's nothing I can do, now there's something you can do. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is a, a very good thing. Uh, we are orchestrating it through the church office uh, we're asking folks to, to help us to just make a, a regular contact uh, with members, especially those who can't get out and about, uh, just to be in touch with people. It can be a, a brief conversation of, of just how you're doing. It can be extended, however the Lord leads. But the idea is for us to be uh, connected and stay connected. So if you're interested in that, uh, contact the uh, church office, uh, talk to uh, the, the P's. We've got the P cubed. We've got um, Pam, Pat and Paula 
and so they're all working with uh, the father about the father's business and uh, so if you if you just find anybody whose name starts with a p and they probably know something about what's going on <laughs> so please uh, be aware of that we also have the the bus has has arrived so now we have the school bus pack the bus is coming we're going to spend the month of july uh, dealing with how or helping to, to provide for some of our area school kids school supplies so uh, keep be aware of that they they have a number of needs especially now that we want to be sure that we can help with so next time you go shopping grab some i think glue was did y'all see the list I, I saw i saw something but glue was one of the big ones and i assume like wide margin paper uh, pencils that sort of thing but if you want more information um, make, make us aware of that all right, uh, any other, i tell you what, you're keeping track? I am. Okay, so let's talk about announce, uh, introductions here. Usually, ha has been over the last few months, it's been Pastor Joe and Pastor Bo. So now we've got Pastor Dallas and Joe. So we still have a Joe, plain just old plain old Joe. Actually, that's not true. This is Joe with the, with the, snow. the snow, and the other Joe is Joe with the glow. So that's how we distinguish those two. So this is Joe with the snow, and then uh, what happened is Pastor Joe, Joe with the glow, is with the youth, working with the youth down the building, the other side of the building, and then Pastor Bo is on family vacation this week, and so he's, he's not available. So I appreciate Joe Thoreau coming in and, and stepping up and helping us. Uh, Dallas is, is, uh, started your interview. Hey, tell us about that. I, I, people have been asking me, so they might as well just hear it straight from you. How did it go on the first Sunday of, of interim work over at uh, Shepherd's Way? Is that only, only one tomato. One only, tomato. No. <laughs> they were very, very gracious, very receptive. Um, it was just a great Sunday overall, and uh, my heart goes out to those people, and I'm, my prayer is that I can... Uh, lend a helping hand and insert myself where I'm needed. Uh, and I'm just praying for the wisdom that I need to have so I can uh, help them along, uh, along the way and especially to uh, search for a new pastor. That's their, that's their ultimate desire right now is a permanent pastor. But I thank you for your prayers, much appreciated. And we'll keep, keep praying and um, we, if you're interested, what time does service start? Starts at 10. Starts at 10, mm -hmm. okay. But um, I, I think it'd be awesome if we had a few folks from the church, not nice. all the time, but every once in a while, because yeah. we're kind of possessive. But. Does that include Kim Stewart? No. Oh, okay. I, I, thought, I thought we explained this. You can, you can have anybody except Kim. Yeah, nobody, nobody but Kim. No. Uh, if you're interested in, in supporting Dallas, I think that'd be awesome. If you want to take a Sunday here or there uh, to go over there, that'd be, that'd be fantastic. Which is kind of lends to what we're doing. We're trying to replicate. We're trying to, to invest in other congregations and help other, other churches just like they help us as sister brothers and sisters in Christ. So it's a good thing. All right. Let's talk about the prayer list tonight. We've got a number of things we want to be praying about as we are as going through um, the prayer list. One that came to my attention this afternoon, um, Sam and Kathy Stewart. Sam is the pastor at North Oak Baptist Church, and his wife, Kathy, is going to have um, stem cell transplant tomorrow. And with everything that's happening, it's not going to be as, um, he won't be able to be there with her like he would normally be. A number of things happening there, so we want to remember the Stewarts um, in, in our prayers uh, tonight. Um, as I go through the list, we've got a number of things. Uh, a lot of folks have come home. The Yvonne's come home. Um, Diana has come home. Um, let's see, we've got others. Um, Donna Kusick at uh, First Baptist Crystal River uh, under radiations. And oh, well, good news on, on Taylor Cernich, uh, recovery from her knee surgery. So that's exciting that, that she's doing okay. What's that? I saw her here tonight. Well, there you go. Wow, that's pretty good. Yeah. 48 hours and she's walking through here? Cartwheels or just walking? Wow. Yeah. Just walking? Okay. All right. Other updates tonight. Carl Taylor's Carl. at Diamond Ridge. Yes. That's another one. This is so, this, I tell you what, it really hits home when folks are going through things and aren't allowed visitors. I called one of the, uh, the nursing homes, uh, the rehabs today. It wasn't nursing homes, it was a rehab. And I said, I want to come visit so-and-so, and they said, we can't, we won't let you. So it was one of those where, you got to be kidding me. I mean, it's just, that's frustrating. Carl is the same thing. Um, can walk, see through a window, is that what the deal is? Yeah. Is that how yeah. the, yeah. yeah. So. All right, so I'll be praying for Carl and uh, for Sally. Uh, Jim Taylor, definitely want to be remembering him. 
his cancer has returned and spoke with him and he is still going through the, the tests and still trying to find out things as they go. We have a correction though. Uh, Jim Taylor doesn't start his treatment until next Thursday. Okay. Okay, so it's not tomorrow, it's no. next Thursday. All right. All right. Welcome to July, by the way. Yes. Yeah, happy July. Yeah. Happy, and uh, what we is have the prayers candidate? for Dave and Joya. Yes, it's good to see Dave in, Dave. in church on Sunday. Yes. Be praying for the, the Clarks. All right. Yeah, pray for my mom. My mom, who's uh, 95, and um, she's, in a, she's in a nursing home in Rhode Island. She has been tested positive. Mm. Oh, no. Really? But the thing is, she's just tired. She's not exhibiting any other symptoms or so. Just good. Okay. Pray for her. Well, that's, we went through quite a few here, but Dallas, do you think you could lift up best to your recollection, recollection some of these? Sure, be glad to. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. And uh, I'm so thankful that you bring scriptures to mind that we've looked at, studied, memorized, especially the one where you encourage us to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let our requests be made known to you. And we know that you know all of our requests anyway, but still, reaching out to you brings comfort to us because we know that you identify with us. There's nothing we can come to you with that you would be surprised. And we know that you're working in every way, in every way, shape, and form with every individual no matter how small or how great uh, the physical problem is or the spiritual problem is. Um, I know for a fact, personally, how you've wrapped your arms around me at times when I need it. And I know also how you've kind of kicked me in the backside when I needed to get moving. So you're concerned about all of us, not just one part. And we lift up to those, Lord, who are having issues, who are separated uh, in nursing homes and, and rehab centers and hospitals where we cannot go and visit. And yet we pray for our brothers and our sisters. And I pray, Lord, right now that you'd wrap your arms around them and give them a tight hug and let them know without a shadow of a doubt that you're right there and that you're experiencing everything with them and that you will bring them through this valley out the other side. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, are there any other prayer requests that we want to add or any other corrections, things we want to be praying about tonight? Crickets. What's that? Crickets. Well, they're a bashful group. Well, I've been out there. I've, I've yeah. been bashful, too. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard, yeah. All right, if there's nothing uh, specific, um, any other, anything coming up online, Dallas? Right now. Thank you for uh, watching that, being aware of that. Okay, well, let's, um, let's move into our, our time of, of study then, if we've got no other requests that are, that are coming up. But we will gladly pause at any point if we need to or, or have that want to look at the question. I'd like to give it a little more justice than we did on Sunday. Uh, it's just one of those things where we talk about the question. If you're not familiar with what we're doing, we're going through a question a week, and it has a, it's a, a biblical um, paradigm frame, a worldview, a biblical worldview where you understand from a Christian's perspective how we view things. And it's things that we've got to, sometimes we assume everybody knows this and talks about it, but you shouldn't do that. We need to be sure we're all on the same page. And when I can, I like to preach on the question and, and the passage or what's connected to it. Uh, this last Sunday, we went a different direction, so I want to spend a few more minutes on this question and answer and the scripture. Um, actually, I had preached on that passage a few weeks prior, so that helped me kind of not to worry too much about it, but I do want to talk about it for a minute. So the question this week comes out of New City Catechism. The question is, what else does Christ's death redeem? Do you guys ever think about this? I mean, before you saw the question, obviously you, we've got a heads up, but has it ever occurred to you that the cross did more than just save sinners? 
which is huge, but there was more that was happening there. Yeah. It's, it just amazes me. You think about what happened on the day of the crucifixion with the sky, with the darkness, uh, with the, the temple, with the earthquake, with the, the curtain torn into, um, everything that was happening. You go into the book of Romans and it talks about how creation groans mm -hmm. and how there's this, 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 because of sin and how the impact of sin went beyond just humanity, it was create the created order. Um, we, we think about the things of destruction that uh, I'm not 100%, but I, I would think a lot of what is uh, weather related, tornadoes and hurricanes, I don't know if that would necessarily be the way it would have been before the fall. Um, what things that, that, the droughts and that sort of thing. So I don't know, Garden of Eden. I wasn't there, so I really have no clue. You have any idea? Oh, I'm thinking it was pretty idyllic. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I I, I'm sure they had exactly the water that they needed for the plants. Everything was yeah, yeah. spot on. Everything was perfect. Yeah. Okay, so if this is the question, what else does Christ's death redeem? The answer would be Christ's death is the beginning of the redemption and renewal of every part of fallen creation as he powerfully directs all things for his own glory and creation's good. You think about, think about the, what that means, what that, that is saying. Beginning of redemption, renewal of every part of fallen creation as he powerfully directs all things for his own glory and creation's good. And what we get, where we get the passage from that is Colossians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile himself to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So when we come to the Colossians passage, there's two big themes in that, that pericope, that, that, those few paragraphs. One of, them has, one of them has to do with Jesus being the firstborn of all creation, and then the first, second has to do with him being the firstborn from the dead, which is his priority. His, he's number one. He takes preeminence. So creation... When Paul was writing in the church in Colossae and they were talking about all the things that Jesus, hey, Jesus is great, but maybe we need to think about Jesus plus this or plus that. And Paul said, you understand there is no one greater than Jesus, no one um, more su substantial, more powerful. He is God. As a matter of fact, everything in all of creation, whether you see it or not, is under him. And by his blood, blood of his cross, the last part of verse 20, the blood of his cross, he brings everything together. Which means, and I, I've, I've studied a little Greek, so I'm pretty confident in what I'm about to say. When he says everything, it means everything. There you go. And yet it was, and yet a, part, a portion of God's creation is still perfect. We've had spring, summer, winter, and fall since the beginning of creation. All the stars are all still there since the beginning of creation. The world has traveled around the sun 365 days to get around it since the beginning of creation. Okay, so you're talking about the order of things, the natural the order? order? Okay. Chaos came on the earth. Right. But we still have common grace. Yes, we do. Which is, which is another a theme that we see through the scriptures, is that even when we are sinners by nature and by choice, his grace still sustains us. Which means everything beautiful, everything arts, everything um, uplifting, everything that's noble, um, even if you're not a Christian, you can enjoy it because of God's common grace, because he loves you enough not to let you be fully um, thrown out um, to everything that you could do against you. What are you thinking, Joe? Well, as I was preparing for this evening, Jesus, that's the answer, okay? So that's the Sunday school answer. I know it, but it is the answer. You know, it's interesting. As I, you know, as I was reading through this, just talking about every part of fallen creation, and it's hard to think about creation itself being fallen. But we, if you look at just outside of the human beings themselves, and you look at the natural, you know, what we, what we consider nature, look how God has used that so much. In, in, in things that he has done that he's noted through scripture as far as controlling that, as far as, you know, from the flood to, um, to the fish, yeah. to um, even to a burning bush, even to when the sun 
kind of, and you're talking about the things, the order, when he directed the sun to go ahead and, and change so that the shadow changed yeah. as well. It just shows his control over all of creation. Amen. In addition yeah. to so it, what, what's the problem? Are we, is, is my faith, is our faith so small that when we fail to realize, or maybe God isn't our vision as much as he should be, we fail to realize he really does have everything under his control. He is the creator of everything. So yeah. there, is no, there is no weather, there is no, there is no issue, there is nothing that is bigger than God. But why do we act like that? Why do, why do we let things get to us? Well, obviously, it seems as though when we start getting into these questions here, it's gonna, we're going to yeah. see where, you know, sinful nature of man is just a major part of who we are. Well, let's, let's, bring, it, let's bring it really close to home. Is it wrong for us to be protective against this virus? Because God's bigger than the virus. So what, how do we respond as Christians to the, to the, the beer, I mean the coronavirus? Yeah, well, but that just because you believe in God doesn't mean you're going to run out on the highway in front of a, you know, an 18-wheeler. You know, obviously God has given us some common sense and, and things in order for us to, to deal with you know, the everyday aspects of life. So being, but but be, for Christians to worry about it, you know, there you go, the, the yeah. distinction between worry and just be wise, be good stewards. Exactly. And there's no exemption. I mean, you go through Scripture, exactly. people were killed, number, innocent people were killed throughout Scripture. It had nothing to do with whether they were being faithful or not. As a matter, matter of fact, Hebrews 11, you've got folks because of their faith were killed. Yeah. So this, this isn't a, a kind of a, hey, I've got a plastic bubble around me and no, no one's going to hurt me if I follow Jesus, at least not on this side of, of, of glory. Yes. Okay. All right. That's exactly what the other guys do. I talk for 20 minutes and then they say, okay. All right. Let's go, let's go to the questions that we're, as we go through. Uh, so we're looking at some of the questions for this week with uh, the life group questions. And uh, the first one, if you ever falsely accused someone, boy, there's a wide open question. You falsely accused someone, what happened when you realized your mistake? Have you ever done that to God? Jesus. <laughs> yeah, all right. I have. Yeah. I, th I think it's fair to say we all have. Yeah. So there's, there's been points where we've, we've been wrong and uh, accuse someone of doing something that... If you really want to understand it, I think a question could follow that. Have you ever been falsely accused? Uh, yeah. You can yeah. understand then. Yeah. Okay, so what happened when right, you so, realized your mistake? So you want to understand the process of what goes on? Yeah, well, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Well, I would say one of the things is, you know, it, it, for, probably what leads to false accusations is there's, there may be some kind of an argument that takes place, okay? And, and then, you know, maybe an accusation is made during that. So I'll kind of stew in my rage for a while, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, or let that feeling of being betrayed. Yeah, it kind of kind of hurts your feelings if people don't think the best of you, doesn't it? Yeah. But, and then usually with me at least, then you know I'll, I'll I'll cool down and 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 I find this is a great time to pray, you know, is is to go ahead and to and to and to seek some knowledge where see well seek knowledge, true knowledge, and uh, and then it leads to trip, typically confession and apology and uh, and ultimately reconciliation. Life would be a lot easier if we would just skip to that last one, wouldn't it? Instead yeah. of doing all the stuff in between. All right, what about, what about doing that to God? Have, have you all ever uh, falsely accused God of, of doing something or not doing something? Never. Never? Never. Never. Okay, well, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to say I have. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, good. I wanted, to, I wanted to see what you, how you would respond. I can, I can think of a, not a number of times, but I, one in particular. There was, it was a number of years ago, and we were, we were in a bit of a, a pickle in terms of our, our home and our finances. And I was, I was really trusting God to provide in a way that I thought made perfect sense. And I was like, you know, come on, God, come on, come on, you can do this. And I, I remember I was driving home, and I remember where I was when I was driving, and I was screaming in my car 
and I can't imagine if somebody was driving by, if they even they saw me and what they thought. But I remember yelling at God and saying, surely, surely you're, you're not understanding this. What have we, have you ever used this phrase, what have I ever done to deserve <laughs> this? And even as I say this out loud and I'm admitting that's this. That's a terrible question to ask God. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's, that's, that's my point. This is not bragging, by the way. This is, this is, I'm not okay with what I did. But my point is, I was at that point where I was really frustrated. And I didn't understand why, why we were trying to do, I thought we were trying to do the right thing. And we weren't getting the answers that I was expecting. And in hindsight, I was 100% wrong. 100%. But in the moment... It just, it felt like, surely, it makes you question. It makes you question God's motives, God's character, God's, God's love. And that's not okay. I mean, I mean it's okay to, to cry out to God, but, but what really bothered me was, as I look back, he put those pieces together. He, he took care of us. He's done more for us than I can even begin to imagine. And how dare I uh, be so blind to who he is and to falsely accuse, like what we're doing with in Micah, which is the whole point of the question is that they were falsely accusing God of doing what he wasn't doing and not giving him the credit for what he was doing. Well, yeah, it's, you make the assumption that you know better than he does. Well, that's a dangerous, dangerous place to be. Dangerous place. And just for the record, I'm not claiming that today. That was, that was then. I'm not saying that's happening now. And if it was, I would ask forgiveness. All right. Because you're more mature now. I was the same way. <laughs> I was the same way. Uh, <laughs> at my at my last pastor that you know God God brought me there I knew that but when he he took me away it was very difficult yeah and I I called him out on it I mean he put me there but I'd gotten cocky and you know I was kind of all into myself at that time and he said no they need new leadership and I think the hardest thing to understand humility is when I had to stand up in front of the congregation and said God saying it's time for me to step down. Mm. That was hard. Yeah. That was humbling. All right, anything else on the first question? I feel beat up enough, so I think we can keep going. All right, now question number two. Read Micah 6, 1 through 8. What does the passage say? What stands out to you in the passage? What questions come to mind as you read the passage? Do you have any other observations? Would one of you gentlemen be willing to, to read through Micah 6, 1 through 8 for us? Sure. Okay, Micah 6, 1 through 8. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember what Balak king of Moab devised, and what Balaam the son of Beor answered him, and what happened to Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? That is a powerful passage. There's so much, so much there. Do you guys have any? I'm going to start talking unless you guys have comments because I don't want dead air for a minute. But. I really see this as, as a dialogue between God and our own country. I mean, this land was settled for Christian feed, uh, freedom to grow in faith, uh, to grow as Christians. And as we began to establish ourselves, uh, we built the schools, we built Harvard, we built Princeton. Um, and several others, and in, in less than a hundred years, you wouldn't even recognize them as Christian schools. And it's been getting worse every, every, you know, every year. God has done so much for us over 400 years, and yet the so-called church in this country today barely resembles anything like what it once was. And that's very depressing. And what stands out to me is God's honesty. 
He didn't beat around the bush. He didn't hint. He just told the truth, plain, hard truth. Well, think about what's behind verse 3 when he says, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? I just imagine what's behind that, that question where the people are saying, uh, this is too much for me, God. You're asking too much for me. Say, so how exactly have I worn you out? Everything I've been doing for you, getting you out of slavery, getting you through the wilderness, getting you into the promised land. I've done all these things for you. And tell me exactly when it was really bad for you because I've been, I've been there for you. I've been the grace. I've been the mercy. I've been the forgiveness. I've been the patience. I've done all these things for you. And you have the audacity to whine at me about this? What, what, where's the problem again? So you don't like the color of the, of the blankets on the, of the bed you get to sleep in? What's, what's going on here? Why are you getting so picky about the things that don't matter? You know, at, at the very beginning of the scripture, I really like at the very beginning where it says, hear what the Lord says. You know, it's like, boy, listen up. This is really going to be worth your while to pay attention to this. You know, and then he says, you know, have I ever forsaken to you? You know, I'll tell you, the, the book of Exodus, I love the book of Exodus. Because when, when you look at that, and, and you know, and, and, and when you go back... It, it, even back to like in the first chapter, in Exodus 1.8, it says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. So I'm kind of wondering why this king didn't know. Was it because over this amount of time, the Israelites themselves had kind of let things slide? Say, how do you not know Joseph? I mean, exactly. that was Joe. How do you not know Joe? Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Okay. So, yeah. uh, so obviously I'm thinking that the Israelites kind of slacked off They're so that possibly, yeah. th their worship was not there in their yeah. face so they were remembering why they no were there in Egypt in the first place. That's a good point. That's a very good point. What about the part where, uh, I, I say I, I love this, but in a really perverted kind of way, verse 6 and 7, where the people come, come to uh, God and say, hey, we're doing it all right here. We're, we're doing great. Um, we're, we're, we're going above and beyond. We're giving, you, we're giving you an extra five bucks in the offering plate. We are sacrificially living for you. We actually, stay, we actually stay 10 minutes over when the preacher is boring. We're doing all of this. What more do you want from us? But, I mean, this is really serious, though. I mean, you think about how, how audacious and presumptuous this is. Instead of offering sacrifices out of a devoted heart, out of love for God, we're going to do all these things, Lord, and more, more, what more do you want from us? What more do you want from me? It's crazy. But we, we refuse to be honest. We, we, we can't see. We, we, like to, we like to come up with names. And we've been doing this since the beginning of time. We come up with names like murder, stealing, adultery, pornography, fraud. We come up with all these names. God doesn't see it that way. God only knows one, one, one thing, sin. One three little three letter word. All the rest of it is us, the way we describe it. And somehow we can justify it. But you talk to anybody in the world today about sin, they don't want to talk about it. And that's the reason. They don't want to be honest. Because then they have to admit it. But look at what I do. Look at the good person I am. It doesn't make sense. When the um, Israelites were bringing all the material in to build the temple and uh, David's prayer about all of these things that, that we've given to you but wait a minute everything that we're giving to you came out of your hand that's exactly right and so there's this lack of, there's disconnect here in Micah 6 where they talk about hey look at all these great things that we're going to do for you and you're still not going to be pleased by the way and God's like well, wait a minute that's my dirt that's my world that's my creation how, how audacious of you to think that you're actually giving me something when I own the whole, I own the whole place. All right. Anything else on observations from the passages generally, overall? We didn't even talk about justice and kindness and humility. We'll get to that in just a minute. I'm just so grateful that to try to understand how God reacts to mankind. When you think back to Exodus... And the one or two times he had just about had it and said, I'm just going to kill them all. And Moses stepped in and, you know, and, it's, and he could have he could have wiped us out at any time he wanted to. Instead, he sends us a savior. You know, that's just that's I think about the grace in that. I, it's interesting you bring that up. I was reading that the other day when God told Moses 
I'm just going to get rid of all of these guys. They've, they've, they're, they're too much about the, the spies coming back and giving the poor report, 10 out of 12. And God's saying, Moses, I'm going to destroy them, and I'm going to build up my nation through your line. You're going to be my new, my new nation. Yeah. Think about this for a second. Sometimes we think that God was on the point of destruction and whew, thank, thank the Lord for Moses because if Moses hadn't been there, <laughs> boy, then God would have destroyed all Israel. Think about this. Did God really have to talk to Moses about it? No. He could have just done the whole Noah thing and he could have just, just wiped out everybody without even a second word. And then, then who put on Moses' heart the compassion for God's children? So we, we tend to think that Moses was great because he even wrote about himself. He was the humblest man on earth, which I've often <laughs> wondered about that. But <laughs> Moses was great, but Moses was created by the God who put his heart in Moses. So it was just, it's kind of cool how it all comes back to the glory of God. Sam, you got a comment? You don't? Okay. Someone said you did. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Let's keep going. Number three. Do you spend more time complaining or being thankful? I think we can be done there. That's, that's, that's just call it a night. That's good. Um, do you keep in mind all that your Lord does for you? Are you in covenant with God? There's more. Declare his righteous acts. We hit, we hit the question. Are we? reach that point. Which point? To reach because I don't really understand the seriousness of prayer. Prayer isn't it isn't it, it after I know for, for a fact um Times I'll spend my quiet time, and I feel much. But at the same, time, honored by our coming boldly into His presence. A few decades, you you can't help but go on your knees and just. Jesus? Yeah, 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 Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting. And, and you know, we keep When they were crying out, subjected, it says, cried out to God. Hmm. But yet, heard their cry way even <laughs> they were going to be yeah finish up the question with that like co the covenant what is with exodus with the old testament with the new testament why is covenant the theme or the undercurrent through all of this? What, what is it about covenant that we have to be sure we've got our minds wrapped around for us to truly appreciate what we're talking about? Because we don't understand the covenant. The covenant has nothing to do with us. The covenant is all God's. Yeah, but we're in covenant with him. We are in covenant right. with him. So it has something to do with us. That's right. because he made, made it that way. Okay. But when Jesus was saying this is the new covenant, my blood. And my blood. What, what was he talking about? The new covenant is a completion of everything. A, I don't know how to. Well, obviously. Logical. You know, obviously he, pay, he paid for what had happened back. Yeah. 
way back when, starting with Adam, you know, where, where sin was introduced. And he came in, and, and that covenant was that I will pay that price. Mm-hmm. Here's what you have to do in order to be absolved of, of that sin, in order for me to assume your sin. You'd almost have to um, look closely at an Israelite's life. He would come to the temple, he would bring his lamb, they'd slit its throat, sprinkle the blood, do all of those things, and then he goes home and he starts planning for the next time he has to bring his lamb in. And he does that every year for his whole life. And now it's complete. We don't have to do that anymore. Do you remember in the Old Testament, you're, you're talking about Exodus, go back a little bit further back in Genesis where God cut the covenant with Abram. Mm-hmm. Do, you remember, do you remember what happened when he, he put Abram to sleep and he walked, he had the, the pot and the, the halves of all the animals and whatnot? Abram wasn't able to uphold his part of the covenant. And that's what you're talking about whenever you talk about our relationship with Christ. Our, our faith is not dependent upon us. It's dependent upon the promises of God, of, of his covenant with us. And so the Israelites, they were getting the more flesh-centered, man-centered in their walk with Christ or with God. And so they weren't, weren't seeing how they needed God and how, how they were blessed by God and how God was going to keep his word. Uh, but if we don't have that covenant, if we don't have that relationship, uh, then none of this is going to apply. Exactly. None of it's going to work. Yeah. Man loves, man loves to change things, <laughs> change things up. I mean, the only thing Abraham, Abraham had to do, God said go. And Abraham changed things up as it went along the way. Let's go on to the next question, question number four. Israelites, primarily Judah, were exaggerating their obedience and ignoring their disobedience. If you've ever been a child, you have done this. If you've ever had children, you've heard them do this. Um, in terms of uh, overemphasize the, the good stuff and underemphasize the bad stuff. Um, then the, the rest of the question, have you ever complained to God claiming to not know what he wants when you were really just avoiding the truth about your rebellion? Have you ever done that? <clears throat> yeah. Not recently, thank God, but yes. Yeah, but you know, even even David, if you look at the at the, at the Psalms, you know, I mean, there there they, they were times in there where he was pretty whiny, yeah. you know, and he he claimed that he really didn't know what God had in store for him at that particular time. But usually he came around before he finished it. But uh, you know, it, it just shows that uh, that sometimes we we just don't we just don't understand, and uh, yeah. you know, we think that uh, you know, like like you were alluding to earlier. You know, people look at, at Christians, especially a new Christian. Sometimes they come in and they think that, uh, well, you know, if I, this is going to be great. This is going to be a cakewalk. You know, we yeah. can just all hang around and sing Kumbaya, and, you know, life right. is just going to be a breeze. And, and they don't understand the, the challenges that, that come with belief in God. And, and, and even in those times, you know, it's God is, do, we don't, you know, we don't understand his motives. And the reason for doing that. You know, we still need to, we, we look at it as hardship instead of something that God is using to, to refine us and to, yeah. to help us in our, our spiritual growth. Yeah. Growing us up. All right, um, next question, number five. Define the big three, the points of piety that uh, Micah 6.8 talks about. Justice, kindness, and faithfulness. So what, what does this mean when we talk about... Um, require of you but to do justice love kindness and walk humbly with your God so what what do those three mean I like the way he puts it that we do justice is what we do kindness is what we love humility is the way we walk I think the justice is something that is done on purpose not by accident or incidentally I think it has to be an act, a knowledgeable act. Mercy, that's something that originates on the inside and um, it causes us to express it openly on the outside. And faithfulness, um, 
as the message put it, uh, don't take yourself too seriously, but take God very seriously. But I think it's more than that. Um, if you've ever seen um, an Arabian stallion's gait, the way, or even uh, the Lipizzaners, that's who, that's who they are. That, that, this is who we're supposed to be. That, this is our gate with God, the way he intended it to be. So how do you know if you're doing this? How do you know if you're doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with your God? How do you, how do you know if that's happening? Well, can we be, really be just? I mean, you know, God is probably, well, we know he God is just. Is just. Yes. And... Um, He's probably the only one really sanctioned to administer true justice. Right. Which is why vengeance is his, yeah. not ours. And, you know, you know and, and one of the things that I love about the Bible is the parallels between Old and New Testament. You know, and we know that justice was, was identified basically to um, the Israelites through the Ten Commandments. And then Jesus came and really pared it down when he basically told us, you know. And, it, and it's still along the same lines where, you know, love God with your whole being. And God is always first, just as he was in the Ten Commandments. And then, you know, to, to, to love, you know, your fellow man, to love others as, you know, as, as you do yourself. And, and to me, that's, that's just, is to, is to love God with all you are and to be true to treat others the way Jesus would. Well, what about the, the love kindness? What about the hesed? It's a steadfast love. It's the covenant love. It's about um, having that agreement. That's why this is all the undercurrent is covenant is because he's talking about he never broke his covenant with the children of Israel. And that's what Micah 6 is talking about as he was always been loving. He's always been faithful. He hasn't broken down on his part, but they have. Yeah. Here's something I have about kindness. Okay. And in, in the following, it was written by Pastor Stephen Whitmer, and so I'll give him the credit for it, because I'm not this smart. It says, most of us probably try to be nice and pleasant when we interact with others. After all, it works to our own benefit if others like us. Kindness, true biblical kindness, however, is much more than simply smiling and asking polite questions. Kindness is supernatural, like the other fruits of the Spirit. It can only be obtained through abiding in Christ. It's an outgrowth of the genuineness of our faith. And Whitmer gives this definition of biblical kindness. It's a supernaturally generous orientation of our hearts towards other people, even when they don't deserve it and don't love us in returns. And that means that loving our enemies and those who don't show us love or even superficial niceness to us. And, and, it, and it goes on further to talk about even sometimes being, diff, you know, speaking truth in love, even when it's difficult. That's kindness as well. Yeah. Well, it's nice. It's easy to love loving people. It's easy it to love yes. people who are nice back to you. Yeah. But he's really getting to the heart of it. He says this is about loving people who don't necessarily... <laughs> Respond in a loving way. Yeah. So be, be merciful as your father is merciful. Okay. Good. Last question. Oh, what? Wait, oh, wait, oh, wait a minute. minute. There's more. Oh, and I have to talk about faithfulness. Oh, yeah, that's right. Please. Faithfulness. Faithfulness, that's putting, putting your feet to the fire and following God. And one of the scriptures that I love is, is Isaiah 52, 7, where it says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Yep who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. That's, good. That's it. Beautiful feet. That's good. I had a bad experience today when I was, um, after work, I was looking through Facebook a little bit, and the story came up. Uh, I don't know, one of our members of our church said it to me. It was about this 80-year-old man who was in line at McDonald's, and lady behind her, him was honking on the horn because he was taking so much time to order. So when he got to the window, he paid for himself and he paid for the lady. You know, she's out there like this and then he gets to the next window and she reaches out and waves and says thank you, you know, because he showed kindness when she was less than that. And I thought, you know, how great is that? And, and then the last little sentence was, well, then he took both meals and left. 
<laughs> and she had to go all the way around again. <laughs> We were, we were right there, and then it just all fell apart. All right. That close. We were so close. I do want to bring out, though, Matthew 23, 23, because this is Jesus' rephrasing of Micah 6, 8, which I, I so appreciate. That's why we know that the faithfulness is connected with walking humbly with your God. Matthew 23, 23 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the, wall, of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Amen. That's good. All right, last question. What areas, and this is where it gets really practical, what areas of justice and injustice most need the church's attention today? What do you think? What I think is I get to ask the question so I don't have to answer it. That's what I think. How did you get that job? Yeah, exactly. Well, first off, you, I appreciate what you said, Joe, about this is God's justice. In any way that we don't treat another human being as made in the image of God, the sanctity of human life, I would say that starting from the womb, that there is incredible injustice with the murder of babies before they're born. That's injustice. So that's something that we need as a church to give our attention to. That's why we support the Pregnancy Center. That's why we're about that. And also when someone walks in the church and we treat them differently because of their appearance or because of their smell or their dress or their skin color or their education or their speech or whatever area we'd like to pick, that's injustice. But what about in our community and in our country? Is there, are there things that we as a church should be about in terms of, of fighting injustice? I think we've taken a back seat, and, and that's always bothered me. Um, you know, the protesters that have been out for the past few weeks about the injustices that have occurred to not necessarily very good people, but still they were out there protesting the result. And I, I don't see any, I mean, not that Christians need to go out and burn buildings, it's, but to get out in, in droves to, um, Supreme Court or to Congress or their local uh, officials to protest the things that are happening, to give our voice, um, to give our, our, our organization, our religion, our philosophy, the voice it needs to try and change the world for the better. You know, we should be looking out for the least of our brothers. You know, there, there are many situations. We have, we have a huge homeless population down here. And right now, uh, I'm sure it's, it's hot for them or whatever. And, and that's probably something that they can deal with. But I know during those times when it gets really cold, there's a need out there. Also a need for, for people who don't, who don't eat as regularly as we do. They don't have the, the food provided for them. And that's okay. also... Right. And you think about, we have some families in the area that the children are hungry, and that's not okay. And even when, and this comes back to the loving unconditionally, because it's not always because it's bad times. Sometimes the parents make bad decisions. So do we just help the children who are in need whose parents haven't made bad decisions, or do we help the children who are in need who are in need? Is there, I mean, we can't really distinguish and, and punish the children for the sins of the parents. It's one of those where you have to, you have to love them. You have to seek justice. But the, how to do that? How do we do that in a, in a way? I've, I've been doing benevolence since I've been in the ministry. And there have been times when I would have a bag full of groceries and I would walk out to the person's car carrying their groceries. They'd pop the trunk and I'd put my bag, give it to them, and it'd be sitting next to four other bags because they were making the circuit and they were going through and getting the bags from everywhere. And I was thinking to myself, what, what in the world? When their people really are hungry, what are you doing? And then, but at the same time, there's times when they need it, and that there are, there's a desperate need, and we're able to provide that. And we've done some good things here as a church the last few weeks. We've got some great ministries that are happening with Feeding the Hungry. Um, if you're familiar, a couple of days ago, Supreme Court ruled against um, a pro-life um, argument that really set us back as yes, a country. Way back. Um, and that, that things like that that just are not okay. That's injustice. And they're fallible, and they're judges, and, and we need to respect their position and, and respect them as human beings, but I'm not okay 
with their decision and what that's done for the innocent unborn, especially in the state of Louisiana. I mean, there's, there's, it's just not okay. You know, along that same lines now, listen to this. If you can believe this, my wife challenged me last night, if you can believe that. Yeah. I guess the governor, DeSantis, um, I believe from what she said, he signed some legislation saying that any minor or under a certain age, I don't know, under the age of 13, if they were to have an abortion in the state of Florida, it would require parental um, agreement. And uh, she says, well, you know, this could very well lead to more children being born that would be put up for adoption. And then she said, do you want to adopt a child? It's like, Wow, I didn't know y'all were in, in the market. That's good. Well, well, that's yeah. that, that, that led to the the challenge. Oh, another the whole another conversation. That's good. That's well, good. Well, she's young enough, but where you? Do you think? No, you're, I'm not. Okay. All no, right. No. No. All right. No. 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 Joe Pa is a dad. It would be different. There but you but you know those types of things are challenging. And even and I hear this commercial popping up all the time now is looking for a guardian ad litem. Oh you yes. Know? And yes. You know, and I know there are, in this county as well, there are children who are in need of those types of individuals. So I, I, I actually have used to do that. Um, yeah. And it's, it is a, it's a needed, it's necessary. It's something to be able to walk so, into a court of law and help somebody that are defenseless. They have no money on their side. Yeah. That's good. All right. Um, any other comments on the passage? Yeah. How close are we to getting back to normal now? Where uh, are we at? I, I have no idea. I You're the no pastor. One. I know. Isn't that amazing how it little is. I know as the pastor? I think, I think where we're at right now is, is we are, are wanting to get more comfortable, but because of the resurgence, because of the, the higher numbers, we're not, we're not going to risk anything unnecessarily. Um, I do want to encourage, though, if you're not plugged in with a group, that uh, you stay connected because there's no reason as a believer in this body that you should be by yourself. Um, and even if it's on the telephone, even if it's on the screen, but you, you need to have your, your brothers and sisters around you uh, during this time. There's, there's no reason to be by yourself. And if I could plug in, Saturday mornings we're still meeting at yeah, breakfast good. station in that, Beverly Hills. That took 63 Seven, minutes longer than I, I thought I knew it that was coming. Yeah, there you go. All right. Okay, well, if we can have the musicians come up. During that whole time, there were no questions or comments or prayer requests on the online, Dallas? Was that it? Nobody, I, no, nobody there was spoke. nothing. Okay. It said Sam had a question, but a I guess he didn't. Oh, I'd like to know what the, Sam's question was. Okay, no, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, could you tell us, Sam, or is it, is it too late? Way too late. <laughs> Way too late. Oh, okay. Yeah. Accusing toward God. I think that that's a very good point. Let me repeat that. He was saying that whenever we accuse God and we, we're accusatory toward God, it's a lack of faith, and we're claiming that he's not able, which is huge. That's not, that's not okay. Let's stand. Break our hearts, oh God, break our hearts, break our hearts, oh God, break our hearts. Oh Yeah. 
sin, please show your power. Thank you so much for this evening, for clarifying your word a bit more to us. Father, the whole reason we study to know you and to know you, to make you known. So, Father, let us learn not only just how to hear your word and receive your word, but to apply it to our everyday, every moment living. That's what you require. We go now, Father, in your strength, in your love, in your compassion alone. In your powerful name we pray. Amen. Good night.